Um, thank you for jumping on with me to do this. I'm really um, having a lot of fun doing these interviews and it's always exciting um, to meet new people through this process. So um, I know we chatted a little bit and I know a little bit about your story, but if possible, could you just please share a lot more about your story with me? Um, uh, for sure. How did you get sucked into the Lyme world? And um, again, this is, I'm hoping to share this with a lot of different listeners who are potentially maybe not well right now, or maybe they've healed too, or just have no exposure to Lyme at all. But really the idea here is just to, um, you know, share stories, let people know what's going on, but also that there's hope and light at the end of the tunnel. And, and you know, that's what I'm hoping to impress upon people. So with that said, <laughs> could you please share with me your Lyme story? Sure. So I'm from the Poconos and grew up hiking and heard about Lyme at a young age and always took all the precautions that, that you know, your parents told you when you were kids. And even as I got older, you know, making sure that I did the tick look, you know, tick review every time I went out. I moved to a lake probably two years ago. So I'm out in the woods a lot more than I have been in the past. And I'm not sure how I caught it in the, the early spring of 2021, okay. but um, I started to feel pretty bad and I got, before I had the markings, I had actually the extreme definition of fatigue. I've always heard that word and thought that, you know, it was tired, just like being tired in the sense that you're tired at night, but I never had a real definition of fatigue. When you are so tired, you can barely move, barely get out of bed, barely work. And I had that, I didn't, I didn't know what it was. And, you know, I thought I had COVID because COVID was out uh -huh. and I went in for a COVID test and they said, you don't have COVID. And at that time I didn't have any markings and I didn't think anything, but did, Lyme disease didn't cross my mind. And then uh, maybe about a week later, should I keep going? Um, yeah, please. I, this is good. I'm just taking notes if you don't mind to. It just kind of helps me process what you're talking. Sure. So, so a week after I had gone to one of those medical clinics, the markings appeared on my hip. And it, okay. since they were on my hip, it wasn't like the traditional target sign. That, so I didn't really know what that was. I thought it That's was. What I was going to ask you: What kind of markings appear? Did you get the bullseye rash, or was it striations, or was it? It turned out to be the bullseye rash, but it didn't. It wasn't like when you got bit in a back or a leg where you'd actually see the target because of where where it was bit, right, um, kind of on my pelvis. It looked like I was bruised, and like I hit. Uh, the cabinet or a, like a countertop. It looked like I hit a countertop and got bruised. And, okay. you know, when you're older, sometimes you hit your, you do something, you don't even remember, oh, you know, my, I'm bleeding. I don't even remember how I was bleeding. Yeah. So I, the first couple of days of that, I didn't really, again, think anything of Lyme disease. Then well, a week later, and, and now I'm like three weeks into this, then the spots went all over my body. Oh, wow. And it, okay. And it looked, you know, again, like nothing I heard for Lyme. So I had my son, you know, come over to the house. I said, take a look at this. He goes, Dad, there's definitely something wrong. He, you know, I said, what about Lyme disease? He goes, well, does it look like Lyme disease? Because I never knew Lyme disease could be all over your body. I knew you'd get the target sign. Well, of course, then we just, right then and there, we Googled it and we saw that Lyme disease could be like that. So I went to the doctor and and got the the uh, antibiotic prescription, okay. and and that takes a few days for it to work. But I remember, and I'll never forget. On day six, I felt like Superman because I, it finally like started to take away that fatigue, and it was such a great feeling to have have my energy back, and it was uh, euphoria for me. Yes. Now, the interesting thing, so that now took me from like May to late June. Okay. So then from June, July, and August, 
I had pretty severe pain in my um, joints, especially in my knees, which I hadn't had before then. So the antibiotics didn't do anything for that. And my interesting story, and but I was you know excited to share this with you. It's so bizarre, but I got COVID in late August, and the COVID, you know, I got the COVID. It wasn't that bad. It was like a mild flu. But maybe a week after I got COVID, all the joint pain went away. So for whatever reason, the COVID, but I didn't take any medications for COVID, but COVID took away the joint pain I had for Lyme disease. And around, that was very late August and early September. Around the end of September, I lost all the joint pain that I had. Great. And I always thought, wow, I got COVID cured my Lyme disease joint pain. <laughs> That's a, one positive I think I've heard of COVID. Yes. Uh, yeah. didn't really have a bad COVID. There's experience. silver lining on that one. Yeah. <laughs> so when I recovered from COVID, I also you know, didn't have the joint pain. I'm like, wow. So in October of that year, I felt a lot better. Okay. Now, my story didn't end there. I still yeah. didn't feel great. And I definitely, uh, I didn't, still didn't feel like hiking a lot. And I still was tired a lot, which led to me going to the doctor in January, February of 2022. Okay. And the doctor had me, you know, hey, this one test is elevated. You should go get your, a kidney biopsy. So I went and got a kidney biopsy. And it took about three months for that to happen. I went in June. and they. And they did some more blood work and said, boy, that test you had was a little better, but we better do the biopsy anyway. And they did, and they, they found some things. And they said, we want you to get another test in August, a bone marrow biopsy. So in August 16th, I got a bone marrow biopsy. And at that point, and I'd been on blood pressure medicine for 15 years, but it was 160 over 111 or something or what it was elevated and the the nurse said you know we really don't let you leave until your bottom number gets below 110 and i said well you know my blood pressure goes up and down and my ride's waiting for me he said i'll let you go if you promise me to check your blood pressure for a week so i said absolutely this is surprising to me it hasn't been elevated in August 20th, I got back from a speaking engagement in Brooklyn. I watched a movie, and at 1 in the morning, I checked my blood pressure. It was 240 over 140. Oh, my. That led to me driving myself to the ER. Three days later, I found out I had bone marrow cancer. So the Lyme disease story for me is that it masked a lot of things going on. Yeah. And I blamed all the, the tiredness and, and such from really May of 2021 on the Lyme disease. And so when you think you have Lyme disease, I definitely would encourage everyone to check it out and also get a clean bill of health on everything else. Because, you know, for months and months, a lot of people, everyone around my family said, oh, that must be the Lyme disease. The lingering Lyme disease is what everybody kept telling me. Because again, in the Poconos, everybody's hikers and everybody has a Lyme story type of thing. Yes. So what I thought was lingering Lyme disease wasn't, and it made me go slow on the other side, which I'm doing fine. Good. I was going to ask, how, how are you with that part of your journey? Is that getting under control for you or are you still struggling? Yep. So I just, in October, I did a six months of weekly chemo. Okay. And now at the end of April here in 2023, I'm starting a stem cell transplant, okay. 22 days of isolation. But the good news is, is when I'm done, I'll be in you know, remission for a cancer. It's not curable, but they have, have it under control for remission. Good job. So, but that's how my, when you were mentioning this, it's really been like a almost two year journey now from the time I got Lyme disease to, you know, come and clean on this whole blood cancer. Yeah. And that's an incredible story. And I, I think I'd shared with you too, in that 
I sometimes wonder if Lyme contributes to cancer only because your immune system is rendered, you know, incapable basically from the Lyme. And so I just think it sort of leaves the door open for other bad things to also, um, you know, metabolize themselves in our systems. I, yeah, so I, I would definitely you. believe that that has, you know, could be true because mm -hmm. I didn't have any cancer results, you know, the years before then. So. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask, and before that, that was kind of my question. That's like before the Lyme too. Did you feel well all the time? Was your health in good shape? Everything was okay up until that moment. Yes. Yeah, so at at fifty five, I was still in great shape and did a seventy five mile bike race and wow. And you know, was really fit. At fifty six, I was still pretty good, and at fifty seven, it was when things really started to slow down. And, and I noticeably, like when hiking, like hiking up to the top of Delaware Water Gap was more of a struggle than it. And it just, I couldn't believe it. Like, how could I do be so fit two years ago? And, mm -hmm. and again, now looking back, it's like, well, there were a lot of things going on that you didn't know. Yes, 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 so. clearly. The, the perfect storm was sort of brewing in your body. And um, it's, it's, Hard because like you were maybe hearing the signs and symptoms, but as you're also pointing out, Lyme sort of masked that for you a little bit too, and made it harder to identify that there really was something else happening to your body at the same time. Um, so I'm sorry that that's happened, but I'm glad to hear that it's seemingly coming out better on the other side. Did you? Can you share with me? Did you? Once you got your diagnosis um, with cancer and stuff as well, is there anything that you? shifted in your life like nutrition wise or belief wise meditation wise these types of practices how are you maybe choosing to support yourself possibly in a different way yeah, i don't know if i made any pronounced changes with lyme disease but for sure i've been very nervous about going outside okay and i think it's you know i'll definitely have a lyme phobia the rest of my life <laughs> for sure and, and like walking around our lake, I used to just do it like every day. And now I really consciously think like, do I really want to walk around? Do, do I have time to get the spray off of me? Because I don't leave the house now without spraying my feet and such. Yes, and good. So definitely, you know, that's been a major change. And I do walk a lot because the part of the cancer treatment was, you know, walk as much as you can to build up your energy for the stem cell transplant. So I have been walking a lot Great. and spraying and for sure. Um, it, once I got the cancer diagnosis, I definitely went to, or I don't want to say vegan because I eat chicken, but mm -hmm. you know, a, definitely a diet focused on, you know, a lot more vegetables, a lot more of the 13 foods that the Mayo Clinic, you know, describes as the superfoods. Cool. Only to help my body because I knew my immune system was going to be so low. And really it probably has been low for two years ever since I've had Lyme. So yeah. that's I mean I haven't read enough about Lyme to know all the impact to the immune system, but definitely enough to know that I was, you know, compromised for months and then even had COVID after Lyme, which I'm sure was, you know, bizarre attack on the body so to speak. yes yes i'm um, usually with lyme people um vitamin d is low and um, i don't know what your vitamin d levels are at but that's you know critical just to basic immune function and body support so simple things like that even get eaten by that's it. interesting because i'm on a supplement of vitamin d ever since uh, the cancer diagnosis good good Ayurvedically speaking, we would maybe recommend up to 10,000 IUs a day, but, you know, talked with their doctor about that. Um, sometimes I think on the American scale, we go a little bit lower than really what is recommended. And actually, I feel like I've seen some recent um, articles released and I'm not able to cite them off the top of my head, but we're indicating that indeed we should have a little bit of a higher intake level um, than what has been traditionally recommended. So 
food for thought. Um, all right, so that's a pretty crazy story and a lot changed in your life in two years. That's, um, wow, um, that's a lot to process. How are you feeling about things emotionally? Have you gotten, are you processing things okay? I mean, some people are just okay with that. Do you find that you do better to have support? Do you have any type of support groups that you're able to lean on a little bit or family yeah, it's been, structure? I've always been, you know, I'm a former elected official, you know, in state politics. So I've always been kind of on the forefront of being, being out front of things. So I've had a, fa a weekly Facebook blog that I've done charting the course of the cancer treatments because I know so many people that have been there before me. And you stand on the shoulders of so many people. And I wanted to acknowledge them and also thank their their spouses if they, you know, the friends of mine that have passed away from cancer. So I really have been trying my best to honor them and also thank so many people that have been supportive. I've been going to Penn State Cancer Institute down in Hershey. And literally everyone you, you deal with there, they're all happy, nice people. I don't know how they hire people, but I've probably had 26 nurses, you know, because of the weekly treatments and they've all been amazing. Not mm -hmm. one bad experience. I saw someone go into cardiac arrest across, you know, from my pod the one day and they handled it like you would expect a textbook. Like, so the treatment, you know, that I see, I've, my experience in the healthcare system has been pretty good especially there. I've tried a couple of city hospitals in the cancer journey that I would never go back to. I think cities are overwhelmed. And I feel, I mean, it made me feel bad for people to live in cities because these famous brand names have tough situations. But yeah. but yeah, so I've been, you know, positive, trying to spread the love, you know, this big thing on love, getting back into the forefront versus evil. I'm definitely a proponent of telling everybody and everything and everybody will listen that we need more love on the planet. And I don't think I did that before October, but I've definitely done it you know, pronounced in a pronounced way since October. Because you never know when the last time you'll be able to tell somebody that. And until you face that, you don't really think about it. But that's, that's been my game since really probably since September, October. If I'm going out, I'm going out telling people that they better you know, love everybody as much as they can. That's a beautiful thing. And that's one good, like I would say that's the kinds of things I'm looking for in this is like, yeah, you're going through something really sucky, but like what's really one beautiful thing that you can take out of it? And what's one nice thing that's noticeably different in your being? And something like that is huge. Um, love has the power to, overcome everything and it's um really important to love others to love the earth but most importantly to love self and to make peace with self too and i find that really helped me a lot in my healing journey it's just to ultimately really learn how to love myself better um but i'm glad for you that you're sharing that as well because that's a beautiful thing to me i don't know how much you follow me but i find hearts all the time so that's kind of um, I think that I'm constantly sharing and posting as pictures of hearts that I just find that appear in nature. And so um, I'm glad that you're on that page of sharing yeah, that kind of I don't of know how Facebook works. And, you know, the they send you people that you should, you know, like that the suggestion box, so to speak. But I saw you and it was one of your posts about love. And I thought that's what I'm, if that's what Facebook does, I would have, that's who I would have surround myself with. Yeah. And I found that in this journey, that you find you know, the people that are focused that way. And it really helps your healing process because it's nice to know that there's people out there that you don't even know that the same kind of journey. And they're finding that that's the way to go. Not mm -hmm. to be the one complaining that, oh, you know, woe is me, I got cancer. It's like, it's been a blessing. And it's a hard thing for some people to understand, but it really gets your life right. And all your relationships immediately get good. Or you, if you want, like I've made all my relationships on the planet as good as I can make them. And, and the more you throw love out into the world, it just keeps coming back to you in space. It's just amazing. Yeah. 
I, if I was going to say that to anyone going through tough times, just throw love out and it comes back to you, you know, tenfold. Yeah. Even on the days when it's tough, when you think that it's not happening, it, it's very surprising what's going on. Yes. And that's part of what this is too, is like, it's so beautiful to meet people like you because we are on such a similar journey in so many respects and we don't even know each other, you know, but we're not alone on this and we are all in this together. And um, it's very important to focus more on those types of energies, especially when you're trying to heal um, and to live in that space and to put that out and to send good vibes out to all. I know it sounds a little bit um, hopey to say it like that, but it, there's so much power in that. And I'm glad that you're finding that to be um, part of your journey. Would you say that you were pretty optimistic as a person before this happened to you and this just really enhanced it or it's been a complete shift on that perspective? Yeah, I've always been a gung-ho, you know, the guy on the sports team that was always talking it up. So it's not a huge change for me. I think it's a big change for people to hear me using the word love all the time. Okay. You know, that's a big thing. And even though in our family we say, I love you all the time, Enough where other people noticed that, but it wasn't something that I used externally a lot. Now I'm not, like I always say, I'm not afraid to use the word love in anything I've got going on in my life. It's people are uncomfortable. It's a pretty funny thing to be uncomfortable about. Isn't it though? But I think people are. I was going to ask you that. It's like, what are people's reactions back to you when you tell them that? Do they usually tell you they love you back? Do they get a little sheepish like what happens yeah it's kind of some people aren't used to it you know i've got for you know i'm really close with fraternity brothers i've been you know connected to my fraternity now for 30 some years and we always said that saying you know love you brother and it was always the l-u-v you know love you brother that's not been that uncommon to say that especially after like the 20 year mark but we're all like can't believe we survived 20 years after college kind of thing. But more people say it, I think. And then when they're around me, they're not afraid to say it. Because they also know, like, you know, they've, most people have had something, you know, tragic impact them in their life. It's just really, it's how you deal with it. I mean, look how you're responding. It's, it, everyone has their journey, and there's some definitely some ups and downs, but. You know, how you come out of it and, and what happens when you survive. But my thing is survive and thrive. That's been my thing now for six months. Like I'm going to survive and I'm going to thrive. And my company, my company's doing better than it's done ever. Awesome. They're in a cancer journey. And like I've literally had, you know, I've been trying to be good and not go to meetings because I have this big procedure starting next Friday. And yeah, I'm going to be in isolation, but it's just been amazing. Like everything's going so well because I think when you focus on the right things, even your professional life is going to be better. Everything kind of connects better once self is in a better state. It just smooths the whole energy, and I think then you can project a lot differently outward as well. So I'm glad that you're also noticing changes on that side of your life. Um, it just makes the changes that you're going through um, are worth it, <laughs> if you will. It's like, oh, all right, good. Look at that added bonus of what is happening to me and what I'm experiencing. Um, and I also wanted to just comment, I feel like you're, by telling others that you love them, um, you're empowering others to be more comfortable in that space as well. And that's a really beautiful gift that you're giving and sharing with people. I don't know um, if you're familiar with Marianne Williams, but she writes a really beautiful piece and it's just talking about um to not really be afraid of self and god and just our gifts and what we have to give to others and that's kind of what that's making me think about is just by sharing with others that you love them you're empowering them to stand in their own self as well and you're removing that um uncomfortableness possibly that somehow we've inherited because truly we're always born in the space of i would hope love um, and that energy, you know, that pure love energy state um, and life sort of 
knocks us out of it in one way or the other or makes us have a little bit more of uncomfortableness around it. And so that's a good thing that you're helping to break down walls about as well. So thank you for that. Yeah, um, yeah. More people that way. Um, I'm just gonna look at my list here if you don't mind. I wanna um, just make sure we're also touching on all of the questions that I had um, for us. So we talked about obviously how long um, you've been sick and do you, that's another question I, I should say, how long have you been healing versus how long have you been sick? Because I think that's another important mind shift. I don't know if you practice that with your internal dialogue is more of like I'm healing versus like I'm sick. Um, just to help again, get the mind frame going more in that direction. Yeah, and uh, probably everyone has their, like when I had Lyme disease, I really felt sick. Like I was so tired. And you know, to compare my journey, Lyme disease versus cancer, Lyme disease put me on my back. Like the cancer was basically the doctors telling me, hey, you know, you got we got your test results back and you have cancer. Like I didn't feel that way. I didn't feel like I wasn't waiting on a bed, you know, to get that diagnosis. But with Lyme disease, it put me on my back. I was really hurting. I could, you know, for really a pronounced probably two or three week period, I really had struggles just to get up and to make coffee and such. So, you know, that sick versus healing paradigm, like I was really waiting to get healed. Like I didn't know, I didn't know what was wrong. With and when yes. you know, I had a friend that said, you know, maybe it's Lyme disease. And, and that was like three weeks into it. And I'm like, well, I didn't even think of that. And even even though we live in a, the Poconos where everybody's like, it didn't cross my mind. Because yeah. you expect to have the target type of thing. Correct, correct. Mm -hmm. And just for our listeners sake, you know, only 35% of people generally get a bullseye. And so that you even got a rash is more luck, I think, on your side because so many times people don't get any markings at all. And then like, I had no markings and it took seven years to figure out what was happening. And that's, um, you know, sometimes the downside of not getting a rash um, is that you really never figure it out right away. Yeah, so, yeah, so definitely anybody that has extreme fatigue, you know, definitely should get Lyme disease ruled out. That's definitely something I would say to anyone. Now, mm -hmm. my fatigue was so pronounced, there was definitely something wrong. It was just a matter of them trying to figure out what it was. Um, and, and I'm the type of person, and I know a lot of guys are like this, like even though I was sick and stuff, it wasn't like I ran to the doctor to get a diagnosis. Like, you know, I, I'm like, well, this, this will pass. I don't know how many times in my life I've been sick. And I said, ah, this will be a couple of days and I'll get better. This thing didn't pass. Like, it, it just stayed the same. So I feel eventually I had to get checked out. So. Yes. Yes. Well, I'm glad that they caught it for you. Um, pretty much early stages in a sense that it, you could kind of nip it in the bud. Um, but unfortunately, <laughs> the other stuff happened um, as well. And then... So you felt, did you do any kind of um, protocol like Brunner's protocol or any additional herbs or anything like that to help you through your healing process? Not really. I think if, if I look back, the big thing that I did was I, I started drinking a lot more water and staying hydrated because that was one of the things that also came out when you know, going and talking to the doctors about the Lyme disease is you got to make sure you stay hydrated and it you know, doesn't seem like you are. And, you know, go get a, a full doctor's thing. Well, that, that full doctor's thing took me till February because I was busy and such. And I put that off. I don't, you, know, you look back and you're like, you really were sick and you didn't even know it. And you, you were delaying it because you thought, well, oh, this is Lyme disease. And, and that's, that's what it was. But I didn't get the full health checkup till literally six months later. When yeah. I probably should, looking back, I should have got that done in October, you know, or sooner. Understood. 
Yeah, so that, and I know, you know definitely people who have talked to me in this cancer journey of changing your diet and things like that. So I was mindful of that. And I immediately went into that. Like my August, August to October was all research on diet. Good job. And I, you know, definitely, even I won't say I'm the best eater on the planet, and then there's, there's no way I'm a true vegan, because my little fun story is tater tots became my thick. Like, <laughs> tater tots have got me through the chemo. I had 23 <laughs> weeks of chemo and had tater tots every single time afterwards, because it was the one food that didn't make me feel sick. Okay. And when you're going through that, you got to find the foods real quick because you don't, you learn real quick. You don't want to eat foods that don't make you feel good. No, absolutely. And absolutely. potatoes and, and certain foods may, didn't have any negative impact. And, and fruit. So it's an evolved diet for, I'm sure everyone that's going through chemo is, is finding the things that don't make you feel sick. Yes. And I, and Lyme, like my Lyme disease evolved in the COVID, so it, it kind of never really got to a dietary kind of thing. Yeah, you really got slammed. Um, not to be, but it was like, uh, you got hit with three hard ones right in a row. Um, and, and you're still here. And how are you, like, how do you feel now? Are you feeling better? Is the fatigue gone? And I know you said the joint pain is gone. Kind of. Like when I mentioned like day six of Lyme disease, I started to feel so much better. It was probably about the third month of the chemo. I just started feeling better. Like okay. I started in October and around January, February, I'm like, I really am starting to feel good because the chemo was killing, was everything was happening that was the right way. And like the cancer had been impacting my kidneys and they started to heal and and right now I feel pretty good and I really am looking forward to feeling even better after the next thing I do. So yeah, good job. Good job, Kelly. That's awesome. I I appreciate your attitude and um I'm curious too, are there can you tell me were there specific moments um that you knew that you were healing? Like I I asked this question only because in my own personal experience, there were times when I random things like I'd be driving down the side of the road and I saw a hawk flying and I just had this overcoming sensation in my body that I knew I was going to be okay and heal. Did you have any moments like that that you can recall? Um, I mean, absolutely. I think the one thing for anyone going through a health journey is to find those milestones and moments and, and hold on to them because they really turn out to be something special. Like I've kept a really good journal. Like I've done weekly blogs and all this stuff. And I look back and I'm like, okay, I do remember like these things. It's like I did a, I've been doing these hike, hikes and literally it took me, I was doing 20 minute hikes and I used to do major workouts. So even a 20 minute walk was a big deal back in October and November. I, I was so weak. I've, and I used to weight, I weight lifted my whole life. I could do my age and dips up to 55. And if any guy knows what that is, that's a big deal. That's huge. So, so I lost 75% of my strength through Lyme, COVID, and cancer. So if I could do 100 push ups, which I used to do every morning, now 20 is a struggle. Okay. So I've, I've seen pronounced loss of strength, you know, strength loss. These milestones and getting these things back. I did a this levy loop up in East Stroudsburg. It's a loop between East Stroudsburg and Stroudsburg Bros. It's been a lifesaver for me. But I did it, I did it in a hundred minutes, and I went out and did it in 88 minutes. And wow. even a couple of healthy people said, How did you do that in 88 minutes? I said, Well, it was getting dark and I was hustling because I didn't want to be out in the <laughs> dark. But just doing that loop the first time I did it, I was so happy to be able to walk. It was about, it's about a three, three and a half mile walk. Just to walk three miles was a big deal. And I definitely would say to people going through the journey, find those little things 
and because they really are become special and you really work toward them and and i know i got to get back and do that loop but just the other day you know my daughter my girlfriend and i just walked in philadelphia for two or two and a half hours that was a big deal and i definitely yeah. was really tired from it just like they were but so find those moments and challenge yourself not to the point of hurting yourself but definitely challenge yourself to stay healthy the diet is so important and then the exercise is so important yeah keeping the body moving and i i appreciate your water intake too especially with your kidneys yeah, yeah. for me well it's been that's been a real struggle i personally haven't slept more than four hours in probably two years oh my because of the kidney disease i don't ever sleep more than two or three hours so to that's been a big thing for me because you have to go to the bathroom is that what yeah because i have to go to the bathroom every two to three hours or sometimes it's every half hour oh my like the one thing that the cancer did was you know i could many nights and that's still true i'll go only 30 minutes of sleep yeah you know, for a long period of time during the night so rest is tough rest has been tough i, yeah. I haven't had eight hours of sleep in a long time i now if i have and what happens is i have 16 naps a night <laughs> 16 30 minute naps or sometimes i get eight hour naps yeah or whatever that is but that's my, my sleep pattern so it's something that they're watching you know because it's not something common mm -hmm. not everybody has that happen to them. okay yeah hopefully you can get that a little bit better under control um i'm trying to think about with my Ayurvedic head's like, oh, what can I do to help you with that? But uh, yeah, I haven't yeah. figured that one out yet. And again, I think once I get into remission, you know, when I'm coming off the chemo, my uh, trips to the bathroom lesson. So yeah, we'll see and how I'm, I am next week. Well, and I'm also curious with the stem cells because I I know so many people who have had such good results from that, um, even from a Lyme perspective. Um, that's more the world that I live in clearly as opposed to cancer. Um, but I think I'm, I'm really excited for you because I've heard instantaneous things. I just talked to a lady last week who said her friend got injured, um, in a pretty bad accident and wasn't able to walk any longer and got stem cells and was able to walk out after getting the treatment. And I was like, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like not perfect, but he's at least walking again. So um i've heard again miracles from this stuff so maybe. yeah so the stem cell thing is interesting in that any lingering line that i do have which i believe i probably do that's all going to get smashed by the chemo and so these stem cells are it's real magical and to see see the people going and getting healed is the thing and, and the other thing that you probably know too is when you're getting these kinds of treatments and you see the little kids and the, the senior citizens, you know, losing their hair and stuff, that's the tough thing. And you realize how lucky you are, even when you're going through a tough thing. It's definitely been a, a reconciliation, I guess. Because the Penn State Children's Clinic is right next to the cl cancer clinic. So you see the kids. And it's always so tough to see that. That would be very hard, for sure. Yeah. For sure. So you've been working with East Strasburg University has the Lyme, like a Lyme oh, research yeah. center. Mm -hmm. and, um, what, I can't say what I can do to help promote what you're doing because I don't think enough people know how pronounced Lyme disease is. Oh, until thanks. it impacts them. <laughs> so what we say, you don't get it till you get it, unfortunately. Um, and, you know, I've, for years, I've been chatting away and I know I've got a fair amount of followers just on, you know, social media because I felt compelled to at least try to warn people about it. Um, but there's a good network. I'm part of a group called the PA Lyme Resource Network. Um, and it's all volunteer and we do things to educate the public, get out there and um, just let different groups and organizations know about the dangers of ticks and Lyme disease and tick-borne illness because it's not just Lyme. 
that ticks can transmit. Unfortunately, there's a variety of illnesses that you can inherit from them. And, um, you know, I just, if, if you want to tell people about that group or have them follow me, however, that's all we can ask is just keep educating people about them. You know, if you, you yourself just talk to people about it. And I'm curious what your um, blog is, like how would people find you? Cause I'm interested to read more from your, what you posted as well. Um, how can, where's your site? How can I find you? Oh, it's just on my Facebook page. Okay. So okay. I just write, you know, I think I started week one and started writing and then it became something I did every week. And I'll write one here in the next, you know, couple hours on week 24. So. Perfect. I will check that out. Thank you. Different topics. It's kind of interesting. I would have probably been on your journey talking about Lyme disease if I hadn't gotten a cancer diagnosis, you know, three months later. Yeah. That's how it's pronounced it was because I really struggled with Lyme and my joints. My, my body ached so bad. And I don't know, you know, everybody has a different experience with Lyme, but it really knocked me down. Yeah. yeah. I was so glad when I saw what you were doing. I said, oh, you know, you know, there but for the grace of God, I would have been doing that and promoting Lyme disease all this past year. <laughs> then I got yeah. tackled with something else. So. Yeah, it's funny how God calls us to different things in a sense. Like I was asking for, I was thinking about doing, um, um, I always forget about the name of it for whatever reason, I how committed I was um, <laughs> helping children when they're um, a miracle, what is it? A miracle network? Um, a miracle network, yeah. Thank you. I'm like, what is that? And then I just said to my friend, I was like, I think I'm going to do that. I think I want to help people whose kids are sick, have better quality of life on earth while they're here because I don't have children. And then I think like three days later, I got my Lyme diagnosis and I was like, oh, well, thanks God. <laughs> I'm not quite sure that's how I wanted to have a purpose, but all right, um, we'll take it. And so I just think your story is a good one either way, if you're talking to people about Lyme or cancer, um, because I think truly those are, our bodies are one, right? It's intrinsically related. And whether that was a portal and the COVID amplified everything and just really weakened your immune system that left you more susceptible to the cancer or however that works. Um, you know, I think it's sort of a, a one, one problem in a sense that caused all of it together. It's like the purpose, yeah. you know, so. Um, all right, and then you've already given us lots of words of advice or encouragement for people too. Um, and I appreciate that. And I will do my best to put the link to your Facebook page in this as well. So people can find you and follow along on your journey for your cancer healing. And I'm really glad that you've got, again, the attitude that you have. Truly, that's going to serve you very well in this and in my experience. Yeah, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lift those weekly updates up and put them inside a book. I, I wrote a book before I, all this stuff all happened. So I learned all the process of being, you know, of getting a book published. And that's really one of the reasons why I started going through this of making a pronounced journal so that I, I can share this with others, especially friends and family, not so much to read what my experience was, is so that there's a book that you can read. And one thing I didn't find like in my journey was like, what, what's this all about? And what does multiple myeloma mean? And I, I spent a lot of time on the internet Googling all this stuff, but just for me, when I said, you know, I was less, would love to read something from somebody who went through this so that you know what is it going to be like and and how's it going to feel and you know what's what's it going to be like on the end of this journey which i still don't know i'm still in it but that's what i wanted to do i thought you know i'm going to journal this thing which i never did before in my life and, and you know people it gives a chance for me to give updates to my family and friends on what's going on so that I don't have to call 200 people at a time but that's my hope is to push this put this into a book and in my book I'm going to start it's definitely going to start with the Lyme disease on how this all played out because it's such a unique situation so I and I figure 
you put this in writing and then somebody says, hey, you know, would you be part of a study on how Lyme disease weakens your immune system and cancer can happen? Because it's possible that that did happen. And then we need to learn more. Yes. That's awesome. And what's your other book about? I wrote a book because uh, I'm a former legislator. I wrote a book and I'm in this writing book too now. And this, these big crimes, these big issues that I couldn't solve that kind of still haunt you because you, know, you couldn't help. In this particular case, I couldn't help this little girl going through a big situation in life. And so I wrote a book about it. And hmm. then I started, you know, when I got the cancer diagnosis, I started this website and I'm still in the process of releasing this thing called uh, My Daughter's Team. And it's really the design to get men to start sticking up for their daughters. And because women already do it because they live and breathe it. But I'm trying to set up a situation where men are going to get back involved on campuses and back involved in their daughter's lives to protect them from sexual assault, from sex trafficking. And, and the book was this thing, uh, Female General Mutilation, which is a legislator. This issue came. I never even heard heard of it and knew what it was but it's been an issue that haunted me because it's just it's grown but it's never stopped it still impacts four million women a year and it kind of gets pushed you know under the table so I thought I'd write a book about it and I did all that and that's that really was a demarcation line from when I started to feel tired which when because I wrote that book and I wrote it mostly at night after work so I was working kind of double shifts, kind of get all that stuff done. And then I really started to feel tired after I published that book and, and really didn't even publish it that much because I was so tired, not knowing why. And then I got the Lyme disease and said, oh, the Lyme disease is why I'm tired. Yeah. So kind of funny. funny to go back and look at the whole experience. And so the Audible book is going to come out in the next week. So I'm kind of excited because... The guy finally, he got it done and it's going to be good. And so I'm pushing out the Audible book in the next week. Yeah, and then I'm going to launch my daughter's team at the same time because I just got approval to raise money as a charity. Good. So that's kind of fun. I appreciate that very much. And I'm curious, um, the female genital mutilation, is that happening in the United States or this is like in Africa? Because I mean, I studied somewhat about that, but what I studied was happening in, not in the United States. Yeah, so it's it's very prevalent in African countries. And in some countries, I think there's still 16 countries where 90% of the women are subjected to it. And in Somalia, it's 99%. Egypt, it's 93. Egypt has by far, far the most FGM cases in the world. But it, it always ha has happened in America you know, for forever. And now it's actually on the increase as the Muslim and Christians from Africa population are increasing in America. They're bringing that, um, even though it's against the law, even though this, they, I forget the exact number, but there's close to, you know, millions of potential girls in America that are subjected to FGM. So much so that we have a law in America against taking your daughter to a foreign country to have it done. Um, FTM tourism is what they call it. So when you, the fact that they even have a name like that is just terrific. So actually, yeah. the, there was an FTM act and nobody knows about it because it was passed on January 5th. We all know what happened on January 6th. Yeah. So the whole thing was so bizarre because I'm writing this book as this is going on and mention it in the book that this thing passed and no one will ever know because what happened on January 6th, you know, changed America. So, but it's still there and it's still prevalent and it's still happening in America. That's so you know, and the thing that happened with me is I was trying to get an injunction to prevent this girl from leaving Pennsylvania. And at that time, Houston was a famous, you know, infamous because their hotels let this happen. 
So, so that FGM tourism was happening in America back in, this is back in 2002, 2003. So, Unreal. yeah, in my family, you know, it's a pretty serious topic. And, you know, the big decision was, do I really want to write a book like this and not get assassinated or something crazy? But uh, that hasn't happened yet. So. Thank but you. the book's out there and circulating. And, and now we're going to go push it out on Audible. Because my big thing is, if people aren't aware of a problem, there's no way to solve it. So you got to make people aware of a problem so that it can get solved. And Correct. the UN and and big organizations are trying to deal with this, but it's getting worse. COVID's made it worse. But now, now they're thinking that another five hundred thousand women a year are subjected to it because COVID kind of allowed it to spread. I don't, I don't know what the word is. But anyway, sorry. That's okay. That's very um, disheartening. I'm glad that you heard of it. Oh yeah, that's it's it's kind of odd in a sense that that's what you're writing about. Just because, well, when you say that's something that haunted you, like that's something that's always stuck with me from my studies. <laughs> like I can't remember a lot of things, but that's one thing that I will never forget about and learning about and just thinking about that happening in my body. And I can't, I, I, I can't. Like it's just awful. Mm -hmm. And so I appreciate the fact that you're taking the time to shed light on it to to educate more people about that um because that's something that probably should have stopped like stopped it should never have started um but it's that is still a practice that's happening today is just awful absolutely yeah awful. these girls that refuse it and stuff they become sex trafficking so there's a link to sex trafficking from fgm it's again horrific that if uh, they're ostracized by their villages for not doing it, they, you know, basically get into a, another whole other problem. problem. It's, it's so, so pronounced. And it's 2023. We're not talking the Middle Ages. Correct. Correct. And even if we were again, like that's still not making it right. Like that just should never, never happen to a person's body against the like, if you want to go do that, I guess, go do that. But um, for somebody to not want to have that happen to their body and to be forced into it is just horrible. I mean, people do piercings and stuff to their body. So, I, you know, some people like things like that. But <laughs> um, Yeah, but then it's on their own, their own opinion. It's not. That's correct. These girls are, usually these girls are eight to 10 years old. They have no idea what's going on. No, no, at all. No. Oh dear. So yeah, I've had a lot of not a lot of communications, uh, text communications with women all over the world. You know, but you know, so now it's even worse than ever before. But now it's like, can you help me? My daughter's eight years old, and so you know, how do how do they prevent this from happening? And, you know, I personally can't stop it, but I'm just trying to do my part. But I think Amer you know, until America and Britain decide that they're going to do something about this, you know, globally, it's never going to go away. And it's going to be America. Like Americans need to know this issue so that we stop it around the world. Correct. Correct. Is there something I can do to help with that? Well, I'll send you a link to my website. Okay, great. You're launching in a, this week, actually. So. Yeah, that would be nice. Um, I could put that on there. And, um, you know, so other if you if listeners want to also help uh, with that kind of cause too, then I can put yeah, that in there for them. My strategy is to Americanize the issue by talking about rape on campus, which is you know something Americans refuse to address. I don't know why, and you know all the stuff with Bud Light and everything going on in the news. I'm trying to like. How do we get this issue onto the college campuses? And, and in that, then to start the conversation, well, this is the other thing that's happened to women around the world. Yeah. Because campus rape is just ridiculous. It's it's a really bad epidemic. And no, even though there's the Cleary Act to, to force colleges to report it, there's nothing 
comes after the Clery Act to fix it. And the alcohol industry just sells alcohol unfettered. And, and some of the things that I've watched with this Bud Light thing really are portray what's wrong on college campuses. Like they just want to sell more beer. And, and they don't really care about the consequences. And, and I don't want to blame alcohol on every single rape on a college campus because that's not necessarily true. But, but it's definitely a major factor. I would imagine it is. So, I would absolutely imagine. And that's just, just a tragedy. Again, once you get involved in these things, there's a, a lot of tragic stuff. So, and I know and this isn't part of our program necessarily, but it's really been inspiring to get you know, this diagnosis with cancer and get, like, I got to get this stuff done. I don't know how long I have, but I'm going to get this stuff done. So, that's okay. what got me focused on my daughter's team. and. Yes, it came out, probably came out a day too quick, but probably November when I still wasn't feeling well was when I started pushing this out the door, and I've slowed it down so that I do it, do it a little better. Okay. So I did an event down at Moravian. I wanted to do the first event in in Bethlehem because Bethlehem is where the Cleary Act started at Lehigh. Because you're in the Lehigh Valley, aren't you? Uh, Burks, but yeah. Oh, Burks. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so the whole the whole thing on this starting to happen with solving campus rapes was the tragedy that happened that resulted in the Cleary Act. It was a rape and murder in the in the dorms at Lehigh University back when I was in college. So, so anyway, it's always been something I too many friends, too many sorority sisters that I knew, you know, impacted, and I always. One of those other things, like if I have the time, I'm going to do something about it. So. Well, thank you for being that kind of a man, Kelly. We truly need more men like you who are not afraid to do that and stand up for that and help to express those views and hopefully maybe lessen some of the violence and things that are happening to women. Um, because I can say we are definitely... I don't know, maybe someone will hate me for saying this, but I would find that I'm physically weaker and I can be more vulnerable that way than therefore and things can happen to me against my own choosings, partially because of that. As much as I can work out and try to protect myself, there are things that happen that sometimes you can't really protect yourself against. And so um, by putting different viewpoints in, in perspective and helping others see that and shining lights on those things is huge. And um I'm thinking about my college professor. She she would probably be like, I, I want to give you a big hug. I should probably connect the two of you and see if um, you can help each other because she's very committed to these types of things as well. And that's who I learned from about the female genital mutilation and, and different things that happen. Um, she teaches at Penn State, but she's very much into women's rights and, and furthering women's um protection so but again thank you from the bottom of my heart as a woman and uh, and i'd be pleased to meet her because this whole thing's about opening up doors and making connections and and your mission on the lyme disease is really just meeting people like me that'll help you extend the message that's right and, and she's helped me with so much and helped me be a stronger woman and more committed to being a voice I did a HIV AIDS awareness project through her and she helped me to look at the world more through that lens and just teaching people and standing up for rights of people and doing what I can. And I, I feel like that would be a really beneficial connection for you because you are also on a very similar journey that way. And it's very important for that. So. Yep. We have, there's always that saying that people meet for a reason. So. Amen to that. Amen to that. And that's partly why, in my own way, like the Lyme journey has been great because I meet people like you and because my world's been completely changed. I feel for the better. Granted, I'm healthy again, and it took a really long, long time to get there. So it's maybe a little bit easier for me to see it like that. But ultimately, this has been one of the greatest blessings that I could have had in my life to get sick because I feel that it's turned me into the greatest or it's turning me into the greatest version of myself that I could possibly be. And so um, thank you for sharing your time with me and your story. 
and I will continue yeah. for you on your journey and follow you along. And, um, you know, it, it just struck me too, because I was very close to cancer. I didn't actually go all the way, thankfully. Um, I was able to intervene before it got to that state, but I think I had Lyme first and then it almost turned into that. And it's what I think really, you know, when I think about your story is so much the same that way. Um, and so I know you will, you will get through this and I'm glad right. to see it's shaping you for the better already. So keep going. Well, thanks so much. And I'm so glad that we crossed paths and I look forward to promoting your book when you get it out on the street. When, when's it going to be out in the street or is it on the street? Uh, not yet. So um, I'm working on actually launching my website, the Silver Liming, um, May 1st. And that's so when I intend to have these podcasts available to start being listened to. And then the book will come out not too much longer after that, because I really wanted to just do, um, you know, I, I, what I have decided upon is seven stories that I just want to include in the book about healing and just sharing hope. Because like you, I really longed for stories like that to help me um, to encourage me. And so if I can return that to others and put that love out there for others to hold on to and, and guide them through their journey, that's really what I'd like to do. So we can help promote. I think stuff. you're wise to do the, you know, advance work before you release the book. I didn't really do it the right way. Like I was just really anxious to just get it done because it was my first time through. But doing if i would have done 60 days even of just getting ready to launch the book it would have been a lot better well but guess what you did it just the right way for you and you got it done and so there's no right way or wrong way right. I don't know i'm doing it at all like i'm just like okay I, I think this is gonna work you know um we learn from our experiences and so you did it perfectly for you and good job because it's not an easy feat to even get a book written are you kidding like yeah, yeah. And you're doing it again. So, and now you've got more experience and you can say this is maybe a better, better thing to do it this way, but keep going. That's all that matters. Well, I'm so glad we met. Me too, Kelly. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your evening. And I will um, do my best to send you this recording as well once it's complete. Well, great. Thanks so much. Absolutely. Thank you. Good yeah, luck take with care you. Now. You too. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye.